Hello and welcome to the Gallimorphy. Ah, 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 ah. My name is Will and joining me is my co-host Nick. And thank you for joining us on this special bonus episode. Uh, how are you doing today, Nick? Uh, I'm doing fine, Count. Uh, it's great to be here on Sesame Street. Been one of my dreams for many, many years. Uh, welcome to this special edition, pre-season edition bonus episode. Apologies for the delay in actually making the real series, but we've been incredibly busy rehearsing our Count voices, in Will's case, and, and me, general life. Yeah, you, you just haven't quite got that Cookie Monster impression yet, but, but you'll get there in the mm, end. Cookie! Is that I, okay? It sounded a bit Yoda. Well, Yoda, Cookie. Isn't it the same guy? Isn't it Frank Oz? I don't know. It might be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. anyway. Tonight's episode is all dark and mysterious and evil because it's all about the scariest holiday in existence. Halloween. Halloween. Yes, Halloween, uh, which actually is a lot older than you might think it is. Yes, Halloween. Every uh, every child's favorite holiday other than Christmas, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but it, uh, it's it, something... Well, hang on, hang on. What about Easter? Easter? Uh, Easter's all right. You get eggs at Easter. You do get eggs, but I, I think I think you, there's more emphasis on sweets at Halloween. I think Halloween's definitely the better one. And you don't get to dress up at Easter. Well, and... you know, I dress up as a bunny every Easter. Do you? Mm-hmm. Do you not? Does no one else do that? Well, I know that you dress up as as a bunny, but that that's more out of request, though, isn't it? Yes, I do have some odd friends. Yes, and to be fair, you also dress up as a bunny on you know Remembrance Sunday. But yes, Halloween is something that I think a lot of us associate with uh, dressing up in costumes, um, going uh, and asking for sweets, uh, trick-or-treating, carving pumpkins. Yes, it's that season of pumpkin spice lattes, poorly carved pumpkins, and general mischief making, isn't it? And uh, one of the things that makes Halloween so special is, of course, the candy. I mean, who doesn't love candy? Dentists, I suppose. Dentists love candy. It means you keep going back to them. Oh, right. Yeah. Although my my dentist keeps telling me to go away, I think he's just a bit a bit tired of me. Too much coke over the course of my life, and he's like, I can't save you. You're you're lost. That might course. be the bunny costume, if we're being honest here. I just, I just, it's my choice. <laughs> it's my most comfortable work attire. Yes, but anyway, yes. So Halloween generally celebrated on the thirty first of October, which has traditionally been uh, a time of sort of transition uh, in human culture what it being the uh, sort of the closing of autumn and the beginning of winter now there are actually a lot of misconceptions around halloween uh, we tend to think of it as you mentioned as a very american holiday with the trick or treating and the outrageous costumes and the endless pumpkin lattes but you know it's actually a very british holiday it's it's a holiday that was celebrated for centuries in in the england wales scotland ireland it's, it's a very Celtic holiday because it comes from a Celtic festival. And that festival is called, uh, in traditional Irish fashion, it's, it's, it's called nothing like it's spelt. And that's uh, Sowin. Yes, yeah, so Sowin or Samhain, as any sensible person might call it. Um, I knew a Samhain once. Oh. He went to our school, didn't he? Anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Yeah, I don't know. Was he, was he a very spooky child? It's a bit of a loner, yeah. Oh, yes. Anyway, uh, we're not talking about him today, at least, unless he does something historically notable. Uh, we're going to talk about Sowin as um, the the originator of a lot of our modern Halloween traditions. So, uh, Sowin was a pagan festival of Celtic origins, and it was held to mark the end of the harvest season and the beginning of the winter, or the darker half of the year. Uh, unlike Halloween today, it was held on the 1st of November. However, it was a multi-day event and the celebrations did actually start on the evening of the 31st of October. That's right. As soon as it, the sun set, when it became dusk, everyone just basically went wild. They drunk a lot, they ate a lot, they generally got rowdy. In fact, the archaeologists, when they were digging up bones of, of Celtic people, found that there was a higher concentration of alcohol specifically around this period because this is the moment when everyone just lets loose. It sounds a bit like Freshers' Week, really. The reason why it 
it starts as the sun goes down on the 31st was because the Celtic day, rather than starting at midnight, it started uh, and ended at sunset. Yeah, but it makes sense, really, when you think about it. You know, sun comes up, that's a day. Sun goes down, that's it gone. Yeah, I, I think it makes perfect sense. Yeah, the day ends at sunset. Oh, can you imagine that today? That'd be great, like going home at 3.30 because the sun's gone down. Oh, could you imagine that? New Year's, you wouldn't have to stay up till like 1 a.m. You could just go <laughs> go home at 7 o'clock. That'd be amazing. Am I just getting old? But yes, um, the 1st of November was halfway between the autumn equinox and the winter solstice. Uh, which made it quite uh, an important date in the Celtic calendar. It was actually the most important of four quarter days associated with Gaelic seasonal festivals. Uh, The others were called, and um, this is the um, the first dodgy pronunciation. And to be fair, it is in Gaelic, which is like one of the more obscure languages that we've tried to pronounce. But I've got Imbolc, Beltane, and Lugnasa. I mean, excellent, excellent pronunciation work. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I imagine you'd wear your bunny costume in Beltane if you were, uh, if, you, if you were uh, an ancient Gaelic person. Of course, uh, probably made of real bunnies as opposed to just polyester. Coming coming back to to sewing, it, it was a it was generally a, a sort of a triple whammy festival because, as you mentioned, it was it was a celebration of harvest coming to an end. So obviously, crops were. Uh, collected and then you know lots of food was made it was also a new year celebration because it was kind of the start of the celtic new year because obviously the last end of the end of the harvest marked the end of last year but it was also a time to remember the dead so you know they like to pack a lot into their holidays get it all out of the way yeah it's a good idea really just you know very efficient get them all done at once so after the harvest work was complete uh, they used to get the druid priests to sort of light sort of community fires so fires actually are a big sort of part of British history and celebrations. We love a big old fire to burn stuff in. And if anyone's been to Lewis for a bonfire celebration in the last, well, <laughs> forever, you'll, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Lewis? Well, in Sussex, they do a big fire there. Yeah, they have a massive bonfire parade. We'll, we'll, cu- we'll touch on it a bit later, if you're lucky. Oh, okay. If you're lucky. Mm. So they used to light a big community fire. Um, which was considered a representation of, of different things like the sun and new new hope and new life, etc. Cattle were sacrificed and then people took parts of the flame back from that communal bonfire to, to light fires in their homes. And contrary to, obviously, the idea of them sacrificing things, the Celts are often sort of viewed in history as these kind of bloodthirsty savages, but it's not strictly true. You know, they were a, a community as civilised as the next one. You know, they had scholars and, and builders and... and generals and you know all the things you expect from society and generally if they did have to sacrifice someone it would be someone who volunteered so you know not 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 as uh violent and savage as we think i'm not sure about the voluntary sacrifices like all civilizations they had lots of i mean holidays are just a mark in itself of, of a sort of civilized culture and especially ones that come to celebrate people that have died and, and they've lost yeah. and so in was in particular a night they believe that the door between our world and the next life opened, which allowed spirits to return uh, to sort of visit their relatives and it also kind of let in some nasty fairies who like to mess around with you. Yes, it was a bit of a bit of a double edged sword, really. So um, there are sort of records of people uh, making dinner for their dead relatives and then leaving the doors open so they can come in and have something to eat. And then the fairies got in and just turned the place over. Yes, the fairies were, were a concern, though. Um, this actually leads us to one of the most uh, famous Halloween traditions, and that is dressing up as monsters and animals, which is actually something that the Celts would do to try and scare off the fairies, as uh, the fairies would kidnap uh, their ancestors if they were to find them. But you know what's strange is that this, this belief in fairies, and particularly fairies, there's this... Um, feeling among the communities that they sort of lived in in burrows in hills and right up until the 20th century you you know you'd still get people terrified of, of like losing their children to fairies in in the moors and on the hills is, is a genuine fear yeah a, lo- a lot of the sort of urban legends of britain things like uh the the will-o'-wisp uh were actually originally attributed to to fairies and it, it wasn't just fairies as well I, I don't know if you read about this but there were there were some really really gruesome and specific monsters that now we recognize as quite you know big staples of the halloween culture that is alive and well today so you have uh 
there was a shape shifting creature called a puka that uh, you had to give harvest offerings or it would rip up your fields. Uh, there was a headless woman called Lady Gwyn who uh, dressed in white and used to chase people around and was accompanied by a black pig. Oh, that's that. That's who I'm dressing up as this Halloween. Lady Gwyn and her pig. I could dress my cat up. One which I recognise in a lot of uh, literature around the subject is the Dullahan. Was he the um, was he the sexy nurse or um, was he was he the vampire? <laughs> no, they actually had different forms. So sometimes they would appear as like imp creatures, and sometimes they'd be headless men on horses, carrying their heads along with them, riding flame-eyed horses. Oh. Um, and they were considered a, a you know a, quite a bad omen. Which, to be fair, does make sense. <laughs> if you see a bunch of lads with no heads on, <laughs> flaming horses, you kind of think that's probably not good. Yeah, also that that film with uh, Nicolas Cage, I don't think it did very well either. I mean, it's a Nicolas Cage film. Yeah. No. Mm. Uh, yes, I've also got that um, there was a monster called Sluag who would come from the West to enter houses and steal souls. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what they mean by the West. Do they mean Wales? This is this Celtic holiday. So the Celts covered a lot of Europe, actually. So it'll be from beyond, beyond the West. Yeah, beyond the sea. The America. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Bloody Americans. Bloody Americans entering our houses and stealing our souls. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they also used to tell really like disturbing stories that weren't necessarily confined to that period of the year. I think it's just what people like back then. If you look at the old Norse stories from around the same time, I especially like the one about the the cow who who licks the block of ice and the man comes out. But we'll, we'll talk about Norse things another time. I just want to get the cow in there. Well, of course you do. As, as you mentioned, there's plenty of weird stories, but perhaps, perhaps the most famous is the adventure of Nera. Or Nera, I, I, I couldn't actually tell you the correct pronunciation because it could actually be like Nera in Celtic, because it's a weird language, in which the eponymous hero is challenged by a king to place a loop around the foot of a corpse hanging on the night of Samhain. And uh, he succeeds, and when he gets to the corpse, the corpse that comes alive and begs him for a drink, claiming that he was thirsty when he was hanged, and he won't pass until he can get a drink. So he probably goes knocking on people's doors with his corpse in tow. Amazingly, he finds a house which gives him a drink. When he gives it to the corpse, the corpse spits it back at the humans who are present, and they immediately perish. That's just rude, isn't it? He then returns the corpse to the gallows, and then journeys back to the king, only to find it completely set aflame by a fairy army. It's the thirsty corpse. Has, has it got any bearing on this story? Yet? Or are we done with him now? We're done with the corpse. He's okay, back we're on done the tree. with the thirsty corpse. Right, um, he's done. He's done, yeah. So he, he follows the fairy army back through their mound and mm. finds himself on the other side on the in the afterlife, yeah. where he promptly falls in love with a fairy and gets married. Of course he does. Who then tells him that the fire was a hallucination, but will actually happen unless he can get there in time and warn them for, for real. Returning to the real world, he finds that absolutely no time has passed, a bit like Narnia. And, uh, and this is actually a common theme in a lot of Halloween stories, this sense of time not really being a real thing. He, he he does get there in time and he warns the king who manages to destroy uh, the, the fairies before they attack. So, uh, however, Nera, Nera he uh, has to spend the rest of his life in the after. Swings, swings and roundabouts. You mentioned that Saren was a time of um, sort of excessive drinking, didn't you? I mean, every, hol- every holiday is a time of excessive drinking when you think yes. about it. I mean, have you ever been to a sober wedding, a sober christening, Christmas Easter. Uh, hang on, I have uh, a sober christening. I, um, have you been to an Irish christening? I have not been to an Irish christening. No. Oh, there you, there you go. Do they bathe the baby in whiskey? Where do you think where the baby's head expression comes from? Oh, okay. So uh, it's been on a few years, and as Christianity is starting to gain a foothold in these uh, pagan Celtic communities, um, the church attempts to reframe some of the old festivals as Christian ones. This is quite a common thing. I think we might have mentioned it in, in our Christmas uh, episode last year. Uh, but they were quite keen on, on sort of transitioning these pagans to Christianity. And they felt an easy way of doing it was, was to just give them like for like festivals. Because as it turns out, they were just the festivals were the fun parts. So, so why not use that as a, a bit of an incentive? But the first attempt to reframe sewing as a Christian celebration was by Pope Boniface 
in the 5th century. He made the mistake, though, of moving the celebration to the 13th of May uh, and specifying it's a day to celebrate saints and martyrs. Uh, The problem was that this still left the end of October open, so people just carried on celebrating the old old festival then anyway. However, in the 9th century, Pope Gregory III uh, had the bright idea of moving the celebration back to October and November, um, so it essentially overlapped with the old one. And, and did a better job of replacing it. Uh, but he declared it to be All Saints Day. So you could say uh, that he was he was hoping to get into heaven with, with that. He was hoping to get into... To get into heaven. Are you not an All Saints fan? Have you never heard that song? Never mind. <laughs> well, I'm alone here. I bet you're the type of bloke that just listened to Pure Shores and then moved on. <laughs> to be honest, I assumed that you were suggesting that you wanted to get into a, a famous Soho gay bar. Well, that too. I mean, who wouldn't? It's a great place. Especially with a name how do you, like... How do you know about heaven? Pope Gregor, I used to work in Soho. I know what heaven is. Heaven is a place on earth. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> let's let's move on. So, yes, uh, he, he, he made the 1st of November All Saints Day, uh, which is surprisingly not about the band, as we've joked around. Or the fashionable clothes shop. Or the... F- Why is it fashionable? Although, if, if they're listening, it's very fashionable you should buy from there. And I'd appreciate any free items. Yes. And also, All Saints Day was uh, was a day supposed to be about obviously celebrating all the patron saints saints of, of Christianity, or in this case, rather specifically Catholicism, because all the schisms hadn't happened yet. Um, and the second day was uh, was a day to sort of commemorate all the people that have been lost in your life and, and all, all the people that you cared about. It was a clever move, actually, because it kept all the traditions of, of sowing it kept the sort of harvest feel. It kept the celebratory feel of like a, 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 a without the new year bit, but it kept the celebratory feel with the Saints Day, and then it had the mournful aspect with the All Souls Day afterwards. It was a good idea, actually. It was actually um, there's a letter from Pope Gregory the First, so uh, and a slightly earlier Gregory, which he sent to a, a bishop in the sixth century, in which he suggested that the Christian Church should be um, adopting. The, the pagan sort of festivals and traditions and making them their own. But it, it was quite a clever marketing move from the church. They appropriated and assimilated. Yes, they did. The, the Catholic Church, well ahead of their time. Yes, so they, uh, they, they appropriated and assimilated uh, the old festivals. Uh, however, the old tradition still continued. And uh, the 31st of October was later designated as All Hallows' Eve, uh, being the day before um, All Saints Day, which eventually was uh, shortened to Halloween, which is what we call it today. And do you know why it's called Hallow in the first place? Um, because that's what you say when you open the door <laughs> to uh, a child dressed up as a pumpkin. That's not what I say. I say bugger off. You're not getting any candy out of me. Well, luckily, luckily it wasn't up to you. Otherwise, it'd be called bugger off ween then, wouldn't it? Leave Nick alone ween. That's what it should be. No candy <laughs> at the inn for you. Go on then. What, why, is it, why is it called that? So Hallow is actually the Old English for holy. So obviously All Saints Day was a holy Catholic holiday. And All Hallows Eve is All Holy Eve. It's the eve of the holy day. So mm. ergo All Hallows Eve. I think All Hallows Eve sounds nicer than Halloween. Halloween sounds a bit like um, a sort of worm that you get in your gut or something. Or, I don't know, maybe it's like you're saying hello to your friend Edwina, but you can't be bothered to say Edwina. No, that doesn't... <laughs> Just, you go Ed. You go, you go hello, Ed. <laughs> you would go to Weena. But anyway, the, 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 the first recorded moments, um, or the earliest mention in actual sort of text around the specific use of the word Halloween occurs sort of around the sort of 15th century. By this time... Halloween was a universally sort of observed holiday, as well as All Saints Day and All Souls Day. So it was like a, th- as, as we've mentioned, a three-part holiday in a way. And there's special mention of you know people baking bread and and specific pastries and and generally just having a great time. And um, one of the other traditions, which thankfully, thank God, has not survived, was bell ringing. Oh. It was huge. People loved ringing bells. In fact, Henry Henry VIII tried to abolish this frequently. <laughs> not surprised. Even though there were huge fines just racking up, they were just ringing away. Speaking of, of Henry VIII, during uh, Henry VIII's reign, during the Tudor times, it was quite popular during Halloween or uh, All Hallows' Eve 
t- for people to take part in mumming. Have you heard of this one? Is that where you date your friend's mum? No, that's no, sadly not. It's it's a slightly less slightly less East Ender Zuri than that. This is uh possibly one of the precursors to trick or treating. You would you'd you'd dress up and you'd knock on people's doors, but you you um you wouldn't be able to speak to them. And uh, they'd have to give you some money to make you go away. Well, there, there was actually a, a huge tradition of people just going around begging for food and drink anyway as part of the holiday, because obviously holidays, people are more charitable. So they're more likely to actually give you something. But around this time, actually, a lot of the themes that we know about Halloween, a lot of, you know, the, the associations with death and, uh, you know, witchcraftery, they all sort of start to develop as events happen in Europe, like the Black Death, and you've got witch trials gathering in popularity. You you have the sort of slightly darker edge of Halloween beginning beginning to creep in. And this actually solidifies during James the First's reign, as he succeeded Elizabeth the uh, First. In fifteen ninety, um, basically a a bunch of Scottish people were accused of trying to prevent his marriage to Anne of Denmark. Uh, uh, <laughs> they were accused of gathering on Halloween. Uh, then riding the sea in a bunch of sieves, sieves to create storms. Sieves, yeah. This is what it says in the text. I don't know what a sieve might be, but I'd imagine it's a small kind of boat. I'm hearing it as uh, as that thing you use with, when you're you're baking to sift the flour, which wouldn't be a very good boat at all. Uh, well, let's just say boats riding the sea to create storms mm. by also tossing live cats tied to body parts into the water. Which body parts? Whose body parts? I'm guessing arms and legs tied to cats. I mean, there are better ways to create storms on it. <laughs> yeah. Tossing a bunch of cats in the water. Uh, after this, after this, it was considered the duty of every Scottish person to watch their cats the day after uh, Hallow's Eve to see if they were tired from giving a witch a lift to meet the devil. Oh, I see. Yeah, because he'd be up all night. Yeah. And what what were you supposed to do if you had a if you had a sleepy cat on that day? Were well, you supposed to kill it? Kill it, right? If if it's not, I mean, if it's if it's an evil cat who's friends with witches, is it going to hang around and, and let you kill it? Well, you have to catch it first. <laughs> You've got a cat. You you know how evil they are. Well, they're sleepy, aren't they? They've been up all night. They should be easy to catch. Well, there you go. Yeah. So, uh, uh, please don't go around killing cats that you see that are tired <laughs> we don't need that on our conscience um, but anyway the, this ridiculous story was called the North Berwick Witch Trial and after that it kind of solidified witches as, as kind of an evil malevolent force carrying out bizarre rituals and sacrifices and, and riding around with cats one thing we should mention is something happens very very dramatically around this period in fact something happens in 1605 that almost sort of gives halloween a run for its money in british popular culture and, and that something is is actually a someone and that someone has a very big twirly moustache and 36 kegs of gunpowder was it jeremy corbyn no no oh yes no, it was guy it was guy fawkes <laughs> guy fawkes Yes, this is, of course, Guy Fawkes Night or, or Bonfire Night, where children and adults of all ages come together and witness the immolation of a visage of a man. Lovely. Guy Fawkes had quite a rough time of it, really, didn't he? You know, he was a Catholic in a Protestant country, which is why he attempted to blow up Parliament. And when he was captured, he was tortured quite vigorously. In fact, so much so that they had to sort of carry him to the gallows. He just didn't have the strength to walk up. Yeah, there's there's pictures, aren't there, of his um, signature before and after he was tortured, and and before it, it looks like a signature, and afterwards it just looks like looks like my cat did it. And anyway, the, the reason why Guy Fawkes and, and Bonfire Night become a danger to Halloween is because very soon after this, you have the English Civil War, uh, and we all know that how that turns out because it ends up with the king obviously on the block. But just before this happens, uh, during the, that there are actually there are actually three English civil wars. Everyone tends to think of it as one, but there were three parts to it. But just after the first civil war in 1647, uh, Parliament banned every single holiday in Britain except Guy Fawkes Day, because obviously Guy Fawkes Day, you know, everyone's celebrating the fact that a man who tried to blow up Parliament was stopped. So it kind of makes sense from their point of view. Mm. Is this that Puritanism? 
creeping in around then. It is Puritanism, you know, Char- Cromwell coming in saying, "You can't have Christmas. You can't be merry. You can't drink." Yes, you've got to live like a gentle, good, boring Christian. Now Cromwell very much brings us back to the British screwing over the Irish all throughout history. But uh... yes, that statue of Cromwell outside Parliament still provokes a lot of consternation from the Irish community. Britain screwing over the Irish is uh, partially a national pastime. Well, a national pastime, but also it, it what allowed the a lot of Irish immigrants who were escaping the potato famine went to America and they brought the tradition of Halloween with them. And the Americans just kind of took it and ran with it as it, it's now a much bigger holiday. And it, it's much more associated, I'd say, modern times with America than it is with, with sort of uh, the British Isles. No, that's exactly right. I mean, um, people still kind of celebrated it. They would build big bonfires and celebrate Halloween and All Souls Day or Saints Day and Guy Fawkes Day all at once, but they just wouldn't tell anyone. So it, it did sort of continue. And then gradually, you know, when the Puritan laws started to fade away, when Cromwell lost power, his son was a bit of a wimp. So he eventually we went crawling back to royalty, which is where we get Charles II. And Halloween was sort of reinstated. But gradually it kind of just sort of fell out of favour as sort of society progressed. It was traditionally a sort of Catholic holiday and there was a lot of like pressure from obviously the Protestant side of, of the country to not really pay attention to all Saints Day and All Souls Day. It carried on in Europe. It was, it, I mean, it's still celebrated in Europe, All Saints Day and All Souls Day. In the UK, it kind of the, the popularity started to wane and it became a sort of holiday for the lower classes and for children. It was it was kind of a bit of a, of a ridiculed holiday. Yeah, I, I think it's still... Kind of is. I think. I think when a lot of people think about Halloween, they don't really think of it in the same light as something like uh, Christmas or Easter, which have very obvious uh, religious undertones. I think a lot of times people forget the the All Hallows Eve aspect of it historically. It it's it's got a huge history in, in Ireland, and, it, and as as you mentioned, the potato famine strikes in 1854, and loads of Irish people go to the USA. Uh, and they bring the holiday with them because it's always been popular in Ireland. It never went away being being popular. Um, and th- there was also a weird event around this time where Queen Victoria apparently went up to Scotland, who also celebrated it quite a lot. And she partook in a local event at Balmoral Castle. Apparently this got around to the sort of burgeoning middle classes uh, who decided to get back in on the tradition. But it was still kind of viewed as kind of like a holiday for children rather than a holiday for adults. It's because when you, you think about how obsessed the Victorians were with death at times, Halloween seems like such an obvious holiday. You know, it's 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 there, it's in their history, and the neighbours are are practicing it. And and now you've got the Queen going up to Scotland and having a Halloween party. It just seems like a perfect fit for them. But it, I guess the holiday revolves a lot, firstly, around food. It revolves a lot around people going door to door, sort of begging for food. That's something children did. It's something poorer people did. So you can see kind of why the associations begin to sort of creep in, that it's more of a holiday mm. for them. But yeah, it, it does feel a bit odd that, you know, given the, the Victorians' love of death, fell out of favour. But, you know, this is this is around the time when a lot of the traditions that we associate with Halloween are picked back up by the Americans and sort of Americanized and made into what we know today, you know, like the going door to door in costumes, begging for for food, like the uh, the jack-o'-lantern. Now, the jack-o'-lantern is really interesting. Yeah, let's talk about the jack-o'-lantern because the jack-o'-lantern, we know it today as um, a scary face carved into a pumpkin. And um, sometimes you put a candle inside and then you put it outside your house and it's this sort of decoration. Uh, I think often there's this sort of uh, unsaid thing that if you have a jack-o'-lantern outside your house, you're basically saying you're happy for trick-or-treaters to come around and you have some sweets for them and things. Uh, obviously, uh, we do not do that. We we shun the children from, from my house. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. But the, the, um, yeah, the jack... Do you know what the funny, the funny thing is? Uh, pumpkins in America were, were a decorative, decorative item for centuries before Halloween came along. Uh, they were in fact, they were... They were yeah, they were they were more tied to Thanksgiving than they were Halloween because obviously Thanksgiving is kind of a harvesty esque type holiday. This is a, a weird thing historically because I, I know during uh, 
sort of British history, there was a time when having a pineapple was considered decorative. <laughs> I just find it really odd, sort of, for our history that people are using, you know, food as as this sort of. Have you tasted a pineapple? They're horrible. Oh, no, they are. They're, they're strange. But they look funky. They're weird pineapples. Do you know that when you eat a pineapple, you um you digest it and it digests you back. It's got um enzymes in it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's that's what I want for my food to be eaten. Pineapples have nothing to do with Halloween, uh, but pumpkins, yes. Um, now it would be easy to think because uh, the pumpkin is a new world vegetable. I think it's a vegetable. It's a it's a squash. Feels like uh, it should be quite a, a modern thing, you know, at least you know, no older than about four or five hundred years old. But the jack o' lantern's roots actually go back uh, a lot further than that. They were originally carved out of turnips, which were found natively throughout Europe. And uh, these these turnip jack o' lanterns were brought over to America with the Irish, who then adapted them for the native pumpkins. Uh, there's actually a story behind the jack o' lantern. Hopefully, this one makes more sense than your one about people sa- sailing sailing around in, in sieves and throwing cats out into the sea. Okay, <laughs> this is. Are you going to tell us the legend of Jack the blacksmith who outwits the devil? That's basically it. He, he has um. So so this this drunkard Jack. He has a bit of an altercation with the devil one night. <laughs> Sound like a police report. So, so this this bloke Jack he has a bit of a Barney with the devil, and he <laughs> he manages to chase the devil up a tree, and the devil can't get down because of his Jack's there. And Jack says, that "I'll let you down out of this tree if you vow never to claim my soul." So the devil agrees to this, and he comes down, and he and he goes off doing whatever the devil does. Uh, Jack then proceeds to spend the rest of his life acting like a bit of an asshole, uh, living in an ungodly manner. And then when he dies, uh, he's not allowed into heaven uh, because they don't want that sort up there. He's, you know, so um, riff raff, riff riff raff, exactly. He's not allowed in heaven. He gets kicked out. Yeah. So he does the usual thing and he gets sent down to hell. But the devil upholds his end of the deal and says, no, I promised I wouldn't take your soul. So he's not allowed in hell either. So he is then doomed to walk the earth um, forever, not being allowed into heaven or hell. Uh, And the devil, for some reason, I don't know, uh, feeling slightly charitable, uh, gives him a burning coal, which he can use to light his way. So he puts it inside a turnip and uses it as a lantern. It's a functional and sustainable lantern, but you're going to have to keep getting a new turnip every now and then, aren't you? You would. I mean... uh, I'm assuming because the coal doesn't go out, it's some kind of magical coal. So maybe it's a magical turnip as well. I mean, all turnips are magical. Right, you are. They all. Yes. So, so this this tradition of of carving out turnips and sticking embers in them was incredibly popular with kids as as they go mumming, as you so gloriously mumming said. Mumming or mummering, it's sometimes written as. But mum, yeah. mumming is more fun to say. The tradition kind of clicked in america because obviously they didn't really have as many turnips but they had a lot of pumpkins gradually in the sort of end of 19th century you started to get books published on halloween and and people suggesting that you should you know start using pumpkins as sort of jack-o'-lanterns rather than turnips yeah it makes sense really Uh, pumpkins a bit bigger funny enough though the um food is a massive part of of, of all Hallows Eve and Halloween in general. I mean, we gorge ourselves with candy today. But obviously, the, 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 do you know what the most famous fruit associated or food associated with Halloween is? It's not a pumpkin. Oh, 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 it's an apple, isn't it? It's an apple, yes. Yeah. Ding, ding, ding. Yes. And do you know why? Uh, because, uh, because of the um, entirely unsanitary and no longer appropriate in a post-COVID world game of bobbing for apples well that 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 that's partly a reason yes but it's also because apples tend to ripen in october so it makes sense that they'd be plentiful in fact in some parts of ireland the first of november is called the day of the apple which sounds like a terrible b movie from like the 60s <laughs> i would i would watch the day of the apple so yes uh, apples were used for games for centuries in fact there's records that apple bobbing was common across ireland uh, but dying out in england after a good 400 year run so you know it's it's an age old tradition. So you shouldn't shouldn't turn your nose up at it just because it's not entirely COVID safe. But again, a, a tradition picked up by the Americans, and and now it's iconic. Ex- exactly. But there's also other sort of uh, fruits and vegetables 
associated with Halloween and they kind of tie into other traditions weirdly. So you get seeds. Seeds are a big part of it Mm. um, from apples. So apples, there was this game where they cut an apple open and the amount of seeds were counted to determine your future. So if you got two seeds, which you weren't probably likely to get, <laughs> you'd have an early marriage. If you got three seeds, you'd get wealth. If you got four seeds, you might be due a bad accident. So, you know, it, it's all these sort of weird fortune-telling guessing games that we also associate with Halloween today were already traditions back in Britain and Ireland and Scotland, you know, centuries ago. Mm. And um, another, <laughs> another big part of it was pranking way before today yeah, and uh, <laughs> the weapon of choice for prankers was the, was the humble cabbage <laughs> the cabbage I... cabbage was a big winner amongst pranksters because they were sort of light enough and big enough to sort of be thrown at windows and doors and hollowed out and filled with tar before being set alight like molotov cocktails but you know molotov cabbages oh, i'm gonna have to try that this year Flaming cabbage. I bet. I bet that smells nice. It does. But it was also a popular dish used in, in a dish called Colconan, which is potatoes, cabbage, oh, and onion. That is good. Colconan. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the most important food uh, for traditional Halloween was something called a soul cake. Mm. So, uh, in medieval England, solas would go uh, and uh, and beg uh, for soul cakes uh, on Halloween, and. Um, so it's a bit like our modern day trick or treating, uh, but instead of threatening to play tricks on the people if they didn't get a salt cake, they would simply offer to pray for that person's soul in return for the cake. So it's a slightly friendlier approach to it, unless you got yeah, unless you got a flaming cabbage. Yeah. So this this old tradition of, of souling was again brought over by uh, Irish and and Scottish immigrants to America in the eighteen hundreds where it it morphed into um, modern-day trick-or-treating, though it didn't really catch on till about the 1920s. Um, That's mainly because, I mean, a soul cake, we should just point out a soul cake is basically a seed cake made of spice and currants, so it tastes like shite. Yeah, it's a Um, sort of cross between a hot cross bun and bird seed. And a Christmas pudding. It's like, oh, it's not particularly nice. Um, But pranking also made its way across... To, to the States as well, uh, as Halloween got set. In fact, it became such a problem that by the 1930s, cities lived in fear that they'd wake up the next day and be, like, ravaged. You know, telephone poles were sawed down, cattle was released into the streets, fire hydrants let loose to flood the, flood the streets as well. In fact, a lot of Americans considered banning the holiday altogether. So they came up with the novel idea of, of throwing lots of big parades and parties to distract all the troublemakers. There's a there's a great book by by Lisa Morton which has covered a lot of what we said and and she's she's written that in America they uh, the parents in order to stop their kids going out and causing trouble organized activities in the home so they do like apple bobbing in the home and and share candy and invite kids over for costumes and then take them door to door to different houses and this is what she argues to be the true sort of origins of modern day trick or treating rather than the sort of more traditional ones that we've been talking about so there's a bit of debate in history about where the sort of traditions arise from they all sort of share a common background mm. a bit like if you look at every religion they sort of share common origin stories but they're a bit different in how they got there so this 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 is what she argues is where trick-or-treating comes from and it's actually a, a sort of custom borrowed from thanksgiving where kids would dress up and go door to door begging for food um and at christmas something called bell schnickeling which i'm guessing is a german word um where groups of children sort of roamed the streets at Christmas time, offering, tr- offering to perform like tricks and things for for sugary treats. Ah, so very similar to to trick or treating. Yeah, so you get all these different, all the same things sort of happening at different places and at different times, and they all sort of come together. And and by the sort of mid twentieth century, you've got the full blown development of of trick-or-treating being associated with Halloween. This practice of playing tricks has been quite a common thing throughout history. In the the past, it used to be blamed on fairies, which was very convenient for the tricksters. Candy and chocolate are plentiful today, but even up until until, the 60s and 70s, sugar was was a premium, really, for a lot of people. 
So it didn't really take off until the introduction of sort of cheap, plentiful candy. So the original sort of sweeter stuff was like taffy in America. These are replaced with um, sugar pellets. And then these gradually got replaced with what is considered to be one of the most iconic pieces of sweet treats that you can associate with Halloween, at least in America. And that's candy corn. Have you, have you ever had candy corn? I have not had candy corn. Hey, candy corn is the most boring sweet. It's like someone smashed up a stick of rock. It's just, it's rubbish. It's the worst sweet. I don't know why. I don't know why it's so, so ingrained in, in Halloween um, tradition in America. It's because it's, it's cheap and plentiful and it kind of matched the colours of Halloween, which were sort of black and orange. Because orange being harvest, yeah. pumpkins, autumn, black being obviously the, the night, the nights are lower staying in, setting in. So those are the colours of Halloween. I'm going to suggest they switch to Reese's Pieces then. The the good news for you is they were the most popular Halloween sweet until mass production came in mm. and chocolate swiftly took over. Good. See, I, I know Halloween is is very commercialized and it has just become an excuse to sell tat, you know. But I think it's quite, it's just like Christmas, but I think, you know, if you think of that time of year, the 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 days are getting shorter it's getting colder we're getting into winter i think it's quite nice just to have sort of a you know a little thing you know a bonfire or fireworks and these sort of traditions i think it's it's quite nice because otherwise it's a pretty bleak time of year no I, th- I think that's fair it's actually as well it's now the third biggest holiday in the uk behind christmas and easter so we can just look around us as soon as it hits like the end of September, you can just see the pumpkins going up and, and people just getting into the spirit of it all. Yeah, I mean, I, in, Brit- in Britain, at least, as soon as the kids go back to school in September, it's like full swing Halloween. For the rest of Europe, though, it, it's not really taken off as, as much as it has here in the UK. For, for most of Europe, November 1st is still a pretty sacred holiday. But, you know, gradually it's sort of starting to permeate... Uh, it's become more popular in places like you know, Germany and France. And uh, in fact, Germany, <laughs> they, as well as celebrating Halloween on the 31st, they celebrate Reformation Day, uh, the day that Martin Luther nailed his theses to the chapel. So, you know, that's a thrilling holiday right there. Oh, yeah, it's exciting. What, what kind of vegetable do we carve for uh, Reformation Day? Oh, it, does it, it kind of looks a bit like a turnip, so you could sort of double whammy it, I think. And and some uh, countries have national holidays for All Saints Day, like Poland and Slovenia. Still, so it's it's All Saints Day is still a very popular day. It's celebrated. I think much like Christmas and Easter, as sort of a, a lot of people kind of drift away from from religion, we we kind of hang on to those old traditions though. Much like the old Celtic traditions, kind of transcended and carried over into sort of sort of christian times i think these old traditions it it becomes less about the religion and and more about just having a bit of a laugh i think well that's it i mean the original holiday and um, i I should actually point out only the irish celts refer to the holiday of sowing but all the other celtic uh, people across europe had similar beliefs Uh, but yeah people have always found ways to to celebrate and enjoy themselves when when there's a great time of change So that was uh, an interesting look at the spooky traditions of Halloween. Um, <laughs> possibly uh, a much older uh, holiday than you may have thought. At least uh, it was a lot older than I thought it was. I, I always assumed Halloween was quite a recent thing, at least, you know, only a couple hundred years. But it actually goes back over a thousand years. Um, what did you think about it all? I don't know. I'm I'm frightfully happy I've learnt so much about Halloween. Oh god, your uh your jokes are giving me goosebumps. Ah 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 ah. Oh the count's come back in. Hello count, how are you? That's, that's almost... Hey Bert. Hey Ernie. Hey Ernie. <laughs> how are you doing? That's oh. better. Ah, that was a pretty good Bruce is more more Kermit actually. I I'd I'd quite like you to do a whole episode in that voice if you don't mind. As is tradition, uh, as we go through all of this stuff, we figure out or we find something that we think is particularly interesting or it, whether it be you know a nice fact, uh, a really funny myth or uh, generally something that we enjoy. What is yours, Will? What have you got? So we mentioned earlier about how the, the word Halloween was derived from the term 
All Hallows' Eve. Uh, the word Halloween didn't immediately come into common use. It was sort of popularized over time. And one of the people who were responsible for popularizing the word Halloween was the Scottish poet Robert Burns, or uh, Rabbi Burns, as he might be better known as. Uh, and he actually popularized it in his 1785 poem called Halloween. Uh, I mean, he's one of the great English language poets, isn't he? So him using the word Halloween in a poem called Halloween would probably be quite a good marketing move for that term. I quite like Rabbi Burns. Uh, I especially like uh, Burns Night because it means you get to have haggis and whiskey, which is always a pretty good time. No, I like it too. But ever since I've watched The Simpsons, I just whenever someone says Burns Night, I just think of Mr. Burns. Excellent. Well, actually, he was Scottish, wasn't he? So excellent. <laughs> That was uh, that was good. That was Rabbi Burns if he was in the film Train Spotting. Uh, what, what's your interesting fact? Basically, from a for for a short amount of time uh, after 1582, there was a there was a period when there were actually two nights of Halloween celebration, and that's because Pope Gregory VIII signed into effect the the Gregorian calendar. Europe had been using the Julian calendar, which um, basically determined that each year was 365.25 days. Which led to an error, meaning that you get around three to four extra days um, every four centuries. So, you know, what are you going to do with all these days? So the, the Gregorian calendar was an attempt to correct that. Uh, this made calculating the date for Easter difficult, uh, since the um, you know the equinox keeps shifting. Fuck, bloody equinox, never stay still. Bloody equinox. So the Pope had the great idea of, of changing the calendar. So even though the, the Pope had decreed the change... Countries were very, very slow to move to this new calendar. In fact, Britain didn't adopt it until 1752. But many inhabitants were just reluctant to accept this day. So uh, <laughs> a lot of people clung to the old day. So Hallow's Eve was now celebrated technically in the new calendar on the 11th of November. There's um, there's that conspiracy theory, isn't there, that the um, basically the Middle Ages never happened. And the evidence they point to is um, this, uh, this sort of this skip in days but it's actually just a switchover between the calendars. Ah, oh, and with that, that's 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 our fantastically spooky show all about Halloween. So we hope you've you've taken something positive away from this and not cowering behind the sofa from the sound of our voices. No. Hope hope it's given you all chills. Are they multiplying? And those uh, I hope you're not losing control, though. That that wouldn't be a good thing. Try and stay in control if you can. If it, if it helps, you can look forward to uh, Series 2 of The Gather More Free, which uh, should be launching very shortly. So that sounds like you better shape up. Yes, I need a man. A man who can edit podcasts quickly and cheaply. Wait, you're going to pay them? Do I not, are you, Am I supposed to get paid? Uh, forget I said anything. No, no. No, uh, you uh, don't worry about that. Just get back to the editing. You're going to get a cabbage through your window tonight. <laughs> or worse, a soul cake. Oh, no, not a soul cake. Uh, um, well, I'm going to throw candy corn at you. With that, I think I think we'll call that a wrap, shall we? Please feel free to uh, get in touch. We're, uh, you can get us an email, info at the show. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. Uh, and also, please uh, subscribe on spotify or google or apple or wherever i don't know wherever you get your podcast from and uh, we'll hopefully be back soon with, with series two thank you for listening see you next time see ya bye, bye.